Hello, hello. Thank you all for being here. I'm Zuko. And uh, I'm the founder of Zcash. And our, our mission is to provide economic freedom and opportunity to all people. And now I'm going to tell you a detour involving the history of cryptography. And at the end, I'll get back to why that matters to what we care about. So here is the brief potted history. We have about 20 minutes. And actually, I hope there'll be time for questions. So, um, uh, so think of questions. And then you can run up to the microphone at the end. So here's a very brief history of cryptography. The, the beginning of cryptography was in prehistory. And one of the first people that was important to that was Julius Caesar. Um, in 50 BC, Julius Caesar was using cryptography to protect military messages so that the, if, the, if the messenger was intercepted, uh, the interceptor wouldn't be able to understand the message. Or, critically, to replace the message with an alternative message in order to mislead the recipient. Right? And then, 2,000 years later, we were doing the same kind of thing for the same kind of purpose, military messages during the war. And this guy on the right is Alan Turing, who was um, essential for cracking cryptography uh, for the Allies during the war. And along the way, he also discovered a bunch of scientific truths and insights which laid the foundations for computer science. <clears throat> and this is cryptography in a cartoon. Alice on the left wants to send this message over to Bob on the right, and we want it to be protected in transit, both that it doesn't get spied on and that it doesn't get tampered with or replaced. And so what Alice is going to do is use this key to encrypt the message send the message over to Bob, and then Bob has to use the same key to open the lock, right? And this reveals a, a fundamental weakness in the whole concept of this kind of cryptography, is that this implies that Alice has to first send the key to Bob. So you can't use cryptography to send a message securely. You can't use this kind of cryptography <clears throat> to send a message securely unless you've previously sent the key securely. And that was, in fact, how it was used um, for 2,000 years for military purposes, where the sender and the recipient are both members of the same army or they're diplomats who are already have a relationship. And so they've previously shared the key, and now they're using that key to share the message. But this wouldn't be any use for everyone in this room to send a message securely to everyone else in this room because we don't have, we have not previously securely transmitted keys from everyone to everyone, much less the other billions of people on the internet. So this is very limited, but it's all anyone ever knew. It's all that, it's just what people thought cryptography was for 2,000 years until the 1970s. <clears throat> In the 1970s, these people came up with an idea, a concept, which they called new directions in cryptography. And they said, maybe it's possible with our modern knowledge of computers, discovered by Alan Turing, among others, and our modern knowledge of mathematics, we, maybe we can invent a way to have a message that gets transmitted securely from Alice to Bob when Alice didn't have Bob's key at the beginning, they didn't share, they didn't prearrange, but Alice can use Bob's key without any prearrangement to send the message. And this was such a weird idea. <laughs> I love when these new things come up and people disbelieve them. That's always really fun. So this guy invented this idea. His name is Ralph Merkel. In 1976 or 74 or something, 1974, I think, and he uh, submitted a proposal to do his senior project in undergrad at Berkeley uh, to explain how this would work, and, it, and the proposal was rejected <laughs> because the professor said, you know, that doesn't make any sense. You can't do cryptography without previously sharing the key. And um, then these two 
came up with a way to do it efficiently and mathematically. And then these folks, I'm going to get back to the slide and explain what this is doing over here in a minute. Don't forget. And then these folks came up, this is Ravest and Shamir and Edelman, um, came up with a way to do both encryption and authentication, both protect the message from being read and protect the message from being tampered with. And here's a critical turn, turning point in this history. All of these people involved, all these faces I've shown, they not only came up with a new direction in cryptography, a new kind of scientific discovery, they also performed a momentous act of civil disobedience. They correctly guessed that the United States, they were all six working in the United States, they correctly guessed that the United States National Security Agency would try to suppress their discovery. And, and they courageously defied pressure from the NSA, and one of the methods that they used to get their discovery out to the public so it could become part of humanity's shared knowledge was that they contacted this writer who worked for this magazine called Scientific American. His name was Martin Gardner, and he wrote the most popular column in one of these very popular magazines, because remember, this was before the internet, so information got around printed on slices of dead tree, and one of the most popular such dead trees was called Scientific American, and there was a column in it called Mathematical Games. And so there's this really fun detail that this momentous event, which most people probably don't know anything about, but I think it's an important turning point in history, and it happened by these people contacting the author of the Mathematical Games column. And they said, we have come up, we've discovered this scientific truth, and we want the world to know. And we're afraid that the United States military is going to suppress it. And will you help? And so he did. He replaced the column that he was supposed to publish that month with a different thing, which was this, which was a, a little puzzle or a little mathematical game that demonstrated and taught the reader how to use this new kind of cryptography. So not only did these people come up with a fundamental scientific breakthrough, they also came up with a fundamental social change in which cryptography became a public science. It's known all around the world by people in all countries. And this led to a breakthrough in cryptographic innovation. For the next, what is it now, 50 years, 40 years, um, we've had a tremendous uh, explosion and new mathematical discoveries from scientists collaborating together in public all around the world. Hey, what's going on with this? Oh, it turns out, it turns out, these guys, Merkel, Diffie, and Hellman, Ravester, Shamir, and Edelman in the 1970s weren't the first ones to discover public key cryptography. Actually, a couple of guys named Cox and Ellis discovered it 10 years earlier, and the world never heard about it because Cox and Ellis worked for GCHQ, and GCHQ successfully suppressed it. And so it didn't help the rest of the world, and it also didn't help the British military either because they didn't know what to do with it because it didn't fit into their conception of of what cryptography was. So, that's public key cryptography. The next thing that happened was 10 years later, when these folks, Goldwasser and Macaulay, discovered a concept called zero-knowledge proofs. And once again, if you're used to the old thing, the new thing is pretty confusing. In zero-knowledge proofs, not only you don't have to prearrange by sharing the key for, between Alice and Bob. You don't even have to share the message. <laughs> so, example, if I had a document that said, that it had everything about me written on it, it has my name and ID number and birthday and photograph and address and all my qualifications and driver's license and relationships and credit history, and I wanted to prove something to you, like where I live, like I live in the United States, I could give you the document and you could take a photocopy of it and that would convince you of that information being in the document, but it would also give you a lot of other information, right? With the zero knowledge proofs that were invented by Goldwasser and Macaulay, you don't give the document at all. You give a proof that my address is written in this document and it is one of the addresses that's in the United States, but I'm not gonna tell you anything else. I'm not gonna reveal any other information. It's called zero knowledge because it gives zero information to Bob over there 
other than the one truth that you're trying to prove. It's a really weird, mind-boggling kind of thing. That was in the 1980s, and here's an interesting fact. It takes, apparently, judging empirically from history, it takes about 20 years for things to come into public production. The internet and public key cryptography were discovered in the 1970s, but it wasn't until the 1990s that they became widely deployed. And similarly, zero-knowledge proofs were discovered in the 1980s, but it wasn't until we came along 20 years later that they got used for anything. But the next thing that happened was Satoshi, this is, this is the, next, uh, the next hero in my pantheon who discovered blockchain. And I won't spend any time telling you because we're almost out of time and I want to have questions and you all know about blockchain already. But blockchain is really important. And here's a neat fact. The most, uh, the highest honor for a computer science is called the Turing Award. So like if you're, a, if you're a physicist, the most highest honor is to get the Nobel Prize. If you're a computer scientist, the highest honor is to get the Turing Award, named after Alan Turing. And a neat fact is that after a time, the people who had invented public key cryptography were awarded the Turing Award for the most important discovery in computer science. And also after a time, uh, the people who discovered zero knowledge proofs were awarded the Turing Award for the most important discovery in computer science. And so I'm waiting for Satoshi to win the Turing Award. I think they're probably trying to figure out how to give him the prize when he won't show up. Okay, so the first thing that we did with um, cryptography was military, and then the second thing we did was banking. And if you use symmetric encryption, you have to prearrange every contact, every relationship. So you can only have a few banks that all have a prearranged key with each other. And then when we switched to public key cryptography, it didn't make much difference to banking, right? We switched to public key cryptography about 20 years ago now. And banking is almost the same. It, you can use it on your mobile phone now, which is way more convenient than it was 20 years ago, uh, where you had to literally walk into a bank. Um, but there's still only a few banks. But the dream with blockchain and with public key cryptography is to have this instead, where every phone is its own bank. Um, and that should be possible because public key cryptography can allow anyone to talk to anyone securely without having to prearrange a connection. But this dream is not yet realized because of privacy. And this is where I said at the beginning, I'll get back to how the history of cryptography relates to our mission of bringing economic freedom and opportunity to everyone. Well, privacy is, what even is it? It's, it's really, I think, the same thing as decentralization. This is the decentralized conference. And what's important about decentralization is resilience and freedom and innovation and censorship resistance. And you need privacy for those things. Like if there's a censor who wants to prevent a certain book from getting read in a certain country, the censor doesn't intercept shipments of books. The censor just says, anybody who reads this book is gonna get in trouble. Does that make sense? If, if there is no privacy, there's no decentralization ultimately because the most, powerful, the most powerful organization in town will exert more and more control over the system. So we were convinced that privacy was necessary to fulfill the goals and the dreams of decentralization and to provide economic freedom. And I also discovered along the way, as soon as we started this project, that privacy is necessary for business. You can't, if, uh, if Apple and Samsung can see one another's transactions and logistics and everything, that they can't do business. You need privacy for, for all commercial operations. So, we, the Zcash project, uh, we combined blockchains and encryption and zero knowledge proofs to make something that's just like Bitcoin but has, has privacy controls. And I want to say in addition to my argument that privacy is necessary for decentralization itself, I also want to say that the original reason that we got started on it was even more primitive than that. It's that we believed privacy was necessary for human rights and for 
intimacy and dignity and political choices and morality. Because just as a network cannot retain decentralization and innovation and resilience if it can be censored and controlled, similarly, a human being cannot retain the ability to make moral choices and to be a moral animal and to be fully human if they're under the control of someone else. So, I ask you all to join us. We have, um, we have source code you can play with. You can, um, you can uh, be part of the Zcash community and control or influence the future evolution of the Zcash technology. And um, the Zcash Foundation gives grants. I'm not actually the Zcash Foundation. That's separate from me, but I'm giving you this advertisement on their behalf, which is that they give grants for different kinds of projects that are either software development or just other kinds of things like education, community support of all kinds. I'm going to leave this up here so you can um, write down all the URLs or load them up on your laptop or whatever. But now I'm going to stop so that we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you for listening. Question, if you go to that mic, or shout and then I'll repeat what you said. I actually have two questions for you, uh, if we have time. Um, the first one is uh, when, well, is it planned that Zcash is gonna enforce shielded transactions through the protocol? And if yes, what's gonna happen with the past history of transactions that were, that were transparent? Oh, those are great questions. Um, oh, yeah. those, are, those are good questions. Oh. I like those questions is what I'm saying. Um, I'd really love to do that. The first step, so currently, for those who don't know, Zcash has so-called shielded and so-called transparent transactions in it. The transparent ones are just like Bitcoin. <clears throat> we just copied them from Bitcoin. And the shielded ones are the cryptographically protected ones I described. And the question is, are we, is it planned to make the shielded ones required is that the question? By protocol, basically. Yeah, at the, of at the actual protocol layer. I would love to do that, and I think we can eventually. It'll take many years and many steps, and then it will ultimately require um, invalidating people's money who hasn't upgraded, which will be very controversial and painful, and a lot of people will resist. But in the meantime, the first step nobody objects to, the first step is to make shielded transactions much better and more widely supported and faster, and that's what we're working on right now. Okay. Um, what was the other question? Yeah, so here comes the other one. Um, Oh, what happens to the transaction history? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just said basically that you're going to fork. Of, right? Yeah, that's basically, you're right. Yeah, yeah what you yeah. said. Um, but there's another question here, which is, uh, sorry for people who don't really care about this topic, um, but uh, what's going to happen, so let's say Zcash actually uh, implements the knowledge proofs at a usable level. So at a protocol level, you basically don't leak any kind of transaction data, which is great because it means that we cannot do analysis, graph analysis on it anymore. Um, however, what's going to happen to the extra layers uh, at which we're actually leaking data? For example, the, the fact that we are trusting full nodes uh, where we're, where they, who can actually listen to our requests. And That's a really good question, too, yeah. Yeah, you ask great questions. It's just like um, one node other layer, it's just like a bunch more. But. Yeah, so like if uh, right now, if you use shielded transactions with Zcash and some like thief was trying to spy on you to track you down to steal your money, they can't track you down by looking in the blockchain because of the shielded transactions keeping that information hidden from them in the blockchain. But they can track you down if they have hacked your Wi-Fi at the coffee shop or your ISP or if, like you were saying, they run enough full nodes and you happen to connect to their full, the attacker's full nodes when you're propagating your transaction and things like that. And that's, I agree that's a really pressing problem for all cryptocurrencies and we should definitely solve it. Now, right now you can use Tor with Zcash, but it's kind of clunky and probably not very many people do. Um, and we should be able to do better. I have some ideas about that, but maybe we should talk offline. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.
Hey, thank you so much for the talk just now. Uh, just first note, I love your t-shirt. It's really cute. Hard oh. Rock Cafe. <laughs> Okay, my question is really simple. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about your definition of um, economic freedom since it's inside the mission of Zcash? Thank mm. you. What do I mean by economic freedom? Well, I'm just thinking of all these people who've been unfairly denied the ability and the opportunity to save money, to send and receive, to enter into contracts and transactions with others. I just think that's... I, I just think that's probably one of the overwhelmingly important features of our whole planet. If you like, are coming from Mars and you're looking at Earth, you see a whole bunch of people who have value to offer one another and could lift one another up, but they can't because there's no ability to enter into an economic transaction with each other. Thank you. Yeah, a question I have is, do you have an update on the timeline for atomic swaps and when, when that's going to happen with Zcash? You guys are total geeks. You have tech questions. I love this. Um, it should be quite possible already, actually. We, uh, so atomic swaps are possible between basically any two blockchains that have a few basic op codes in them. And we wrote a tool um, that swaps between Zcash and Bitcoin. It's like a command line Python client. Um, so it's basically possible right now. I think the missing parts have to do with um, market and like uh, you know like finding counterparties and price discovery and agreements and an order book and a UX and um, everything like that. And there's a bunch of different projects working on decentralized exchanges today, which hopefully will solve all those other layers, which are much harder to solve. Uh, and then hopefully they'll be able to plug into the atomic swap feature. I hope. Hope that answers your question, but feel free to ask me more if it didn't. How do we incentivize more people to run nodes and also to keep mining decentralized? And do you think that's even important? Those are really good questions. Oh my God, I love these questions. I don't know, I mean, I kind of think it's a really great idea to pay, to, to like have the consensus protocol give out free coins, like newly generated coins to node operators. It's a neat idea. Um, but unlike with miners, it's hard to verify that the node operators are doing good work versus cheating and pretending to do good work. Um, so I think it's kind of an unsolved problem how to do it right. And um, the next one was about mining decentralization. I don't know how to solve it. I suspect it's kind of unsolvable. Like what we really wish for and what Satoshi originally wanted was egalitarian distribution of the new coins, right? Like the real goal is to just give free coins to everyone equally. And I don't think that's even possible technically. I think we kind of did a, we kind of had a lucky window where we could sort of approximate it. Um, but as soon as rich people notice that it's valuable, then they can buy the necessary resources to gather up more of it. And it doesn't really matter what the resource is, if it's hardware devices or GPUs or CPUs or proof of stake or any other, like all resources are purchasable, right? So rich people are always gonna get more of the thing than the poor people are gonna get, as far as I know. But not that I'm gonna stop trying, but. 